good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tamás Beretsky, and um, I'm with the ATG. I'm the ATG communications officer, and I'm also um, a patient advocate living with HIV. I will moderate today's um, webinar, and I suggest that we wait two more minutes for other people, additional people, to join if they want to, uh, and then we and then we go ahead. So, two more minutes, please. Thank you. So, without further ado, I would like to warmly welcome everyone to this uh, webinar jointly organized by the European AIDS Treatment Group, IGLIO, and ILGA Europe. And our topic for today is um, Hepatitis A and everything that we need to know about Hepatitis A, uh, the epidemiology and also treatment options and uh, future perspectives. My name is Tamás Bretsky, I'm the ATG's communications officer and I'm happy to introduce to you Professor Jürgen Rockstroh from the University Hospital of Bonn in Germany who has been working in hepatitis for several years, for many years in fact, and he's also been one of our key partners um, working with the community of people living with HIV, affected by HIV and hepatitis. Um, so I will not uh, rob your time too much, uh, Jürgen. First of all, I would like to give a very short introduction about the system and how this webinar works. Um, you will see the slides on your screen, so if you have dialed in by phone, you will not be able to see the slides, but you can listen to the webinar. If you would like to uh, speak or ask something, then please press the raise your hand button and the, on the control panel, or you can also just write your questions into the control panel, which we will then see. Uh, because this webinar is being recorded, I would like to kindly ask you to hold your questions until the end of, your, of uh, Jürgen's presentation, and then we can um, collect your questions then, and we will have a 20-minute questions and answers session at the end of the um, of the presentation and towards the end of this webinar. So I hope that this is all clear to you, and if you have any questions, then just type them into the questions box. And then I, I give the floor to Jürgen, and uh, this is your first slide. Uh, and please let me know when I need to advance your slides. So Jürgen, you take it away. All right, thank you, Tamás. So it's really a pleasure to spend some time this afternoon walking you through some of the key features and facts you have to know about hepatitis A. Next slide, please. This is my <coughs> conflict of interest. Uh, and the next slide gives you sort of an overview of what we want to cover, quick facts about hepatitis A, address issues around epidemiology, and then obviously, most importantly, talk about transmission pathways. I think that's something which also in the community is important that everyone knows because obviously if you understand how it's transmitted, that may also be a way of preventing uh, transmission, how is hepatitis A diagnosed, how does it manifest its disease, what are the clinical features of hepatitis A, are there any treatments, if at all, and what can we do to prevent it, and what role can the community play in preventing hepatitis A? Next slide, please. And the next slide, which summarizes really the key facts about hepatitis A, it's a picornavirus, it's relatively small, you see an electronic microscopic picture on the left-hand side showing the virus particles. The main transmission pathway is fecal oral, so in contrast to hepatitis B and C, which are very frequently blood-blood contacts, this is something which can be transmitted much more easily uh, if, for example, feces gets into water or is used for um, fertilization of uh, salads, for example. The incubation period, so from the time you get infected until disease develops, is 14 to 28 days. The good news about hepatitis A is it really does not translate into a chronic course, so whereas hepatitis B can become chronic, and usually 5% of patients if they're more competent, a little bit higher if you have HIV, and maybe 60-70% chronic courses in hepatitis C, this never becomes chronic, so that's good. But the problem is the older you get, the more 
sick you can become, and there have been some descriptions of fulminant courses with liver failure, um, and all those all of those cases are rare, obviously, uh, it is something which can have a significant impact on your health. Once you have went through a hepatitis A, you have lifelong immunity. So if you also in childhood went through a hepatitis A, you're protected lifelong, you will not get infected with hepatitis A again. Importantly, there is a vaccination which is available, and so obviously broad access to vaccination is a key in preventing further outbreaks of hepatitis A. Next slide, please. So let's touch upon epidemiology. Next slide. Shows you a world map of the geographic distribution of hepatitis A virus. You can see that a very high hepatitis A prevalence is found in particular in Asia and Africa and South America. These are countries where you have quite a high prevalence of hepatitis A and obviously this is also why in many uh, recommendations from agencies there is a recommendation to have hepatitis A vaccination before traveling to these areas because you have a risk of requiring hepatitis A there. And then there's an intermediate one in the southern European countries, eastern and central European countries, and Russia and China. And then you can see that there is a lower risk in some of the western European countries um, and also in the United States and Australia. Next slide, please. Now this slide does not, is not easy to read, but I, what I try to do here is there has been a recent report from a Taiwanese group looking at all kind of features around hepatitis A among HIV positive individuals. And in this recent review of this year, they sort of summarized the prevalence of hepatitis A in HIV positive populations. And although it's a little bit blurry, you can see in the uh, sixth column where it says HIV positive population, you can see that the prevalence reported are between 40 and 80 percent, so really very high, telling us that a lot of patients who have HIV already either went through hepatitis A or have been vaccinated. So it is something which is found quite commonly. It's also found often in HIV negative men who have sex with men, but it's still always, if you compare to the HIV positive population, much lower. So clearly patients with HIV, quite a number have already went through hepatitis A, but there still is a group left. And then obviously, particularly in MSM who are HIV negative, the rates are not that high, clearly highlighting there is a large group which would require vaccination. Next slide. So let's look at transmission pathways. Next slide. And this is sometimes a little bit tricky. So if you go on the internet and you look at, you know, hepatitis A, B, C kind of things, you could look at the internet which says know your ABCs. Hepatitis A stands there and says it's caused when people do not wash their hands after using the toilet and then touch or prepare other people's food. So yes, it's transmitted over the feces and if virus is in the feces and you get it in your hands and you then prepare food, that would be a possible way. But next, if you just push the button once, what people forget is that it's also transmitted in a sexual context, in particular the sending of men who have sex with men, and that is by oral anal sex. So what we call, if you use the tongue to stimulate your partner anally, then that's what we call rimming. And obviously rimming comes with an increased risk of that transmission in particular. Next slide. It's important though to also know that the virus usually is primarily spread when an uninfected and unvaccinated person ingests food or water that is contaminated with the feces of an infected person. The disease is closely associated with unsafe water or food, inadequate sanitation, and poor personal hygiene. So in areas of limited resources, poor countries, people living close together, water is not clean, so Africa, Asia, and certain parts. That's why there's quite a bit of spread, but you should also know that hepatitis A is also confound in muscles. But in the context of uh, men who have sex with men, it's really predominantly something which is once it comes to an outbreak, it's passed on sexually during sexual acts, and in particular through ribbing uh, is probably the most common way of uh, transmission. It occurs sporadically and in epidemics worldwide, so obviously if it finds its uh, presence and then gets transmitted, it can, and it reaches out to a large group of unvaccinated people, it can erupt quite explosively. There was an epidemic in Shanghai in 1988 that affected about 300,000 people. So it can come very, very quick. 
It persists in the environment and can withstand food production processes routinely used to inactivate or control bacterial pathogens. So it's not killed that easily, and that's why it's probably one of the reasons it can spread uh, quite quite easily once there is an outbreak. Next slide. Anyone who has not been vaccinated or previously infected can get hepatitis A. So that's the person who is at risk. And heirs with the virus is widespread. Most hepatitis A infections occur during early childhood. So if you go into an African patient population, for example, you find the prevalence of hepatitis A is very high. And usually in childhood, the infection does not lead to a lot of symptoms. So many people have gone through hepatitis A without even having ever noticed that they had a hepatitis. Risk factors include poor sanitation, lack of safe water, use of recreational drugs, living in a household with an infected person, and being a sexual partner of someone with acute hepatitis A infection, and then obviously also traveling to areas of high endemicity without being uh, vaccinated. Next slide. So what about the transmission of hepatitis A among gay men? Well, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men have a higher chance of getting viral hepatitis, including A, B, and C which are diseases that affect the liver, about 10% new hepatitis A and 20% of all new hepatitis B infections in the United States are among gay and bisexual men. And many men have not been vaccinated against hepatitis A and B, even though a safe and effective vaccine is available. And obviously that prompts the question, why is that so? Why are people not vaccinated? A lot has to do with cost coverage. So for example, in Germany, there is no general cost coverage for hepatitis A. That has a lot to do with the fact that people perceive this as a vaccination which you take before traveling to areas with high endemicity for hepatitis A, so if you're traveling to Africa, and then people feel if you go on vacation and get your vaccination shots accordingly, you should pay for that yourself. Um, there is an exception though that, in, in, at least in the German context, people who are HIV positive or people who are MSM uh, hepatitis A vaccines uh, should be reimbursed by the health insurance company because of the increased risk of acquiring that infection. Um, but because of these reimbursement issues, been one of the hindrances or limitations or the barriers in an effective vaccine will allow. And again, as stressed among gay and bisexual men, hepatitis A can be spread through sexual activity or contact with fingers or objects that have the virus on it. So also, obviously, sex toys can also be a vehicle for transmitting hepatitis A. Next slide, please. And the big issue I think we have right now is a recent outbreak of hepatitis A. And there were some rapid communications published, one uh, of an outbreak of hepatitis A associated with men who have sex with men from England from last year, and then also one following the Euro Pride in the Netherlands. So telling us that when there are events where a lot of people get together to party and have fun, Obviously, there's a lot of sex involved, and if there are people, per coincidence, who either just had or are on their way to develop an hepatitis A and may be still asymptomatic, they may be shedding virus in their feces and as such can be a source of infection. And once that happens in a larger group of people who are not vaccinated, then we can have an outbreak. And that is something which we're currently now seeing in multiple, multiple places. And if you go to the next slide, you will see that there were some even more recent publications, also from Germany now, following an outbreak of hepatitis A among uh, uh, people in Berlin, and, and again, MSM, so there was, uh, since 14th of November 2016, 38 cases of hepatitis A. Uh, meanwhile, having talked to healthcare providers there who cater uh, particularly HIV positive, but also HIV negative MSM, they're now in the hundreds of in the infections. And I always say, if we start seeing an outbreak of an epidemic in Bonn, where I work, which is, you know, not known for sex parties or a big gay scene or anything, if we start seeing hepatitis there, then it's reached really every part of the country. And we have seen in the last four weeks three cases of acute hepatitis A. And the amazing thing here for me is that two of them are working in the healthcare setting. So one is a doctor, he's a cardiologist, and... Um, it tells you that although he's vaccinated for B, because there is an increased risk, obviously, for working in a hospital setting to acquire hepatitis B, but they didn't cover his hepatitis A. And so, unfortunately, he got that. And the other one is a male nurse. 
uh, who uh, also does not protect against A, but only against B. And that has a lot to do with the German context that on average people get easy coverage for B when they work in the healthcare setting, but A is not considered healthcare working needed um, vaccination. And as such, uh, the, the, the cost reimbursement issue plays in, but really as MSM, they would be entitled to a free vaccination. Next slide. So how do we diagnose acute hepatitis A or hepatitis A? Next slide. So obviously when you have hepatitis, and remember that itis at the end is from Greek and stands for inflammation, hepa, is Greek also and means the liver. So inflammation of the liver basically is uh, what we then relate to hepatitis. And inflammation of the liver can be caused by all kinds of viruses. It can also be caused by autoimmune processes, uh, by alcohol and other drugs. But in case of uh, virus hepatitis, it becomes very difficult because the symptoms are the same. You get extreme fatigue, uh, your stool becomes white, your urine, urine becomes very dark, you feel tired, you may have joint pain, you may feel nausea, may, you may get diarrhea. Uh, but in order to separate the various viral hepatitis forms from each other, you will have to take a lab test and then see whether you can find specific antibodies. And as many other diseases, we separate different immunoglobulin G antibodies, and the so-called IgM antibodies are those who appear first, are always indicative of an acute infection. So IgM, the M, is a specific kind of antibody, usually is for an acute infection, and if it's IgG only, that's a sign of a past infection or the result of a vaccination. So if someone presents, let's say, with jaundice, fatigue, white stool, dark urine, nausea, diarrhea, and we test for hepatitis A, if it was acute one, we would expect to get a positive hepatitis A IgM. That would confirm the diagnosis of acute hepatitis A. Uh, and then you could also do more uh, expensive tests. Uh, for example, uh, do a PCR of the feces or the stool, uh, and there you could detect hepatitis A virus. And that would be important, for example, in the context of can a person return to work, or is he still infectious? Because obviously, for example, if you work in the healthcare environment, you wouldn't want to send someone back who's still shedding hepatitis A and still uh, to go back work in the hospital. Next slide. Uh, remember that for people who have HIV, the European AIDS Clinical Society always recommends that upon HIV diagnosis, you perform a serology for hepatitis A, and in most cases you will find IgG antibodies, either because someone already underwent the infection has now lifelong protection, or because he was vaccinated and developed antibodies, in case he's hepatitis A negative, then that would mean he is at risk of acquiring the infection, um, and, and that would be the ideal candidate for vaccination. And remember that in the setting of viral hepatitis screening, you would also screen for hepatitis C by antibodies, as well as for hepatitis B for antibodies, um, and that should always occur at diagnosis and prior to starting HIV treatment, because it also may have an impact on the regimen it's going to use for treating HIV. And because of the recent outbreaks of hepatitis C, um, we do recommend annual screening in HIV positive MSM for these viral hepatitises. Important for hepatitis C, just on a side note, is that when you have acute infection, it can take quite a while, so much longer than for hepatitis A, to develop antibodies. And so if you have elevated liver enzymes, you will also then be required to do an RNA measurement because that could be already positive whereas the body has not yet developed antibodies, and that would be then sort of indicating acute hepatitis C infection. Next slide. So what is the natural course of hepatitis A? Next slide. So as pointed out earlier in the quick fact sheet, the incubation period is usually two weeks to four weeks. The symptoms can be very, very different from individual to individual. So it can be that Someone just feels a little bit sick or nauseated and then really doesn't notice too much. But it can also be much more severe, can involve fever, malaise, loss of appetite, diarrhea, nausea, abdominal discomforts, which is not too seldom, dark colored urine, and jaundice. And jaundice is what we call the yellowing of the skin and whites of the eyes. Not everyone will develop that, 
But I have to say that at least from the ones we saw, but that's a bias because obviously people who develop symptoms are more likely to come and seek help from the medical uh, system or present in the emergency room. They were all feeling very sick. So by the time they presented, they felt all very, very fatigued, uh, were clearly jaundiced, had extremely elevated liver enzymes, and were also having quite severe uh, nausea and abdominal discomfort. Adults have these signs and symptoms of illness much more often than children, so that's why in many countries like Africa and Asia where you have quite common uh, uh, hepatitis A, in particular because of the water issues, um, there um, they don't have a lot of symptoms, but the severity of disease and fatal outcomes are much higher in older age groups, and so obviously that's something we need to worry about in our HIV patients who are aging. Um, infected children under 6 of years do not usually experience noticeable symptoms, and only 10% develop jaundice. Among older children and adults, infection usually causes much more severe symptoms, with jaundice already occurring in more than 70% of cases. And sometimes people get better, but then start shedding the virus again, that's what we call relapse. But really, in, in general, no chronic course of hepatitis A has been described, uh, so recovery will occur uh, eventually, and there are very few cases of liver failure, usually in pretty old patients with uh, significant uh, comorbidities. Next slide, please. This is a typical jaundice, and so when there is an issue of, with the excretion of bilirubin and it accumulates and it goes over a certain threshold, which we usually say is around 2 to 2.2 milligram per deciliter, then you start getting yellowish eyes. Some people may know that because they're taking rayataz or atazanavir, which inhibits the excretion process for bilirubin and they have sort of a naturally increased bilirubin also sometimes have a little yellow glare uh, in, in the background of, of the white of the eyes. But obviously, this is a much higher bilirubin. The skin also turns yellow, and that's something you usually see with a bilirubin around 10, 11, 12. And actually, the three patients we saw all had a bilirubin way above 10 and were very, very yellow upon their initial presentation. Next slide. Now, one thing to note, and I think this is a nice slide because it tells you a little bit about the course of symptomatic hepatitis A. That means you get infected, and you already are excreting hepatitis A in the stool, but have really no clinical symptoms. And that is obviously the point of uh, where you are infectious to others, but not necessarily experiencing any feeling of being sick. And that's obviously one of the reasons why hepatitis A then spreads, because you know you feel healthy, uh, uh, but already have hepatitis inside of yourself and are shedding it out and, and they pass it on to others. And then pretty much when the hepatitis A Concentration of stools already declining, you start developing your symptoms uh, of nausea, abdominal discomfort, and so forth, and then that comes in with jaundice. So the liver enzymes increase pretty much in the moment when, when also jaundice uh, occurs, and then uh, within around 30 days, the production of IgG antibodies occurs, and then you start losing your IgM, uh, and then eventually uh, only IgG persists as a sign of resolve. Uh, infection, and then usually you can see that after uh, around uh, the latest 50 days, um, there should be no hepatitis A in this stool present anymore. Next slide. What about treatment? Next slide. Now, there is no specific hepatitis A antiviral, so in contrast to hepatitis B and C, which, though, remember, it can become chronic, and that's why you need sort of an antiviral treatment so that people can get rid of that virus again. But since everyone resolves his infection or her infection, there's really no specific treatment for hepatitis A. Um, it's clearly a point where you want to avoid the co-administration of other drugs, uh, for example, for fever lowering or so forth, which may you know, stress the liver even further. Um, hospitalization usually is unnecessary, uh, except when you are sh showing signs of acute liver failure. That would mean that your liver synthesis is severely impaired. So when someone presents in the emergency room, you deliver enzyme values. If they're above 1,000, which is pretty high, then we sort of get a little worried. Uh, we do liver synthesis, and if some of the uh, you know, liver synthesis markers like QUIC or INR uh, 
are changing, and that is the moment where you then would have to hospitalize the patient uh, and, and react according to the liver synthesis uh, function. Otherwise, you just replace fluids, which may be lost through vomiting and diarrhea. So it's a more just sort of symptomatic therapy, but no specific antiviral therapy for hepatitis A at this point. Next slide. So what about prevention? What can community do? So let's spend a little bit of time talking about hepatitis A vaccination. In the next slide, you can see the um, vaccination schedule from the Centers for Disease Control from the US, and I just chose this as one example. Obviously, there are many different national uh, recommendations for adults in this case, and you can see that we have quite a number of recommended vaccines, flu, tetanus, diphtery, uh, shingles, uh, measles, mumps, rubella, you know, all kind of different things. But unfortunately for hepatitis A and B, you can see that for the general population, it only says it may be recommended, but there's no firm recommendation. And I think that's obviously one of the issues because in North America, the coverage for hepatitis A and B is very low. So if there's an outbreak, obviously, because of the large number of unvaccinated people, uh, it can spread quite easily. Next slide. This shows the uh, uh, text in the CDC recommendations. Uh, and so it says uh, for people who, who, tr who travel and work outside of the US, that might be a reason for vaccination. But they also say that people with chronic liver disease should, uh, because obviously another hepatitis on someone who has liver disease is not going to be very good. But they also specifically say men who have sex with men uh, also are candidates in which vaccination is recommended. I think that's something people should know that because they are at higher risk, there is a much stricter or stronger wording for the recommendation for this vaccination, and that's important because that usually comes with cost coverage. Um, the hepatitis A vaccine, when it is given by itself, is given mostly um, in two doses, uh, which are spaced six to 18 months apart, depending on the brand. Um, and uh, for many people, though, who are hepatitis A and B negative, uh, there are combination vaccines. There are also combination vaccines between typhus and hepatitis A and other combinations. Um, and, and so uh, depending on which kind of vaccine you're doing, because hepatitis B, for example, requires more vaccination steps than you might be vaccinated three times, whereas when you just vaccinate against hepatitis A, most vaccines get along with two vaccinations only. Next slide summarizes um, the, the German vaccination schedule, uh, and you can see that hepatitis A is not even on there. Uh, so again, another national example where hepatitis A unfortunately is missed, and that's one of the big problems that although there is a general great vaccine uptake and recommendation in Germany for many vaccines, and you can see that young people are vaccinated against a lot of different things, including now also hepatitis B, so that is something which is now given to newborns or infants which I think is a great advance, but unfortunately, hepatitis A is not in there. Next slide. So if you have not been actively vaccinated, you definitely have not been vaccinated in um, your childhood. And although this is German, and I'm sure not everyone speaks this wonderful language, but I just put it up here because it does, again, say uh, that in specific risk groups, and that includes patients with uh, a sexual, um, sexual risk for uh, hepatitis A, as well as people who have uh, uh, a high probability of receiving blood products uh, all should receive uh, uh, hepatitis A vaccination, as well as people who are living in psychiatric institutions. Um, so there is quite some recommendations here, uh, but unfortunately, um, this is something which many physicians are not that aware of or don't want to go through the trouble of writing an extra little letter saying that this vaccine is strongly recommended because of an increased risk. Next slide. Uh, the hepatitis A vaccines are inactivated, uh, so it's not like a, a live vaccine. There are only very few live vaccines left uh, these days. Uh, it's a monovalent inactivated vaccine, which can be given in a pediatric dose for children below 15 and then an adult dose. Uh, they're extremely safe and very highly effective. Most people already achieve an antibody response after the first vaccination. As pointed out earlier, for most, if you only vaccinate against A, it's a two-dose schedule. If you vaccinate in combination with hepatitis B, it's a three. 
dose vaccination, um, and maybe a somewhat slower antibody response in people who are immunocompromised, uh, but in, in general, the overall response rates are quite high. Uh, it looks as if after two dose vaccination, antibodies do persist for 25 years or more. So more recent uh, no more repeat vaccinations are really necessarily recommended. I think in the setting of HIV, this may be different. Um, serologic testing is not recommended after vaccination outside of the context of HIV. I think in the uh, setting of HIV, you may be a little bit more likely to lose your antibody response. Uh, so I think uh, it may make some sense to see whether you still have antibodies in case you don't have any antibodies left at all, any more than uh, do a revaccination. Next uh, slide. So, as pointed out, there has been a recent uh, review article summarizing all the major aspects around hepatitis A and hepatitis A vaccination in HIV-positive individuals. And in the next slide from this review, I have copied some of the uh, findings and, and, and things they sort of report on. And basically what they do is they compare the different hepatitis E vaccine recommendations from various organizations, including the British HIV Association, the European AIDS Clinical Society, and also WHO. And, and I think what they're doing is, is, is quite wise. And basically, they say that if you have above 350 CD4 count, you should be offered two vaccine doses at zero and six months. If you have um, the uh, stronger immunosuppression and lower CD4 counts, they say you should receive three uh, vaccine doses. And that in the setting of a continued risk of uh, exposure, they should receive a boosting vaccine after 10 years uh, and following a significant exposure. So if someone has says, uh, contact with someone and he calls them a day or two later, says I've been now diagnosed with hepatitis A, uh, then you could receive post-exposure prophylaxis with a hepatitis A vaccine with the first dose given as soon as possible and within 14 days of exposure. And if the CD4 counts below 200, which means you're immunocompromised, then you should also receive uh, normal immunoglobulin. So there's also enriched hepatitis A immunoglobulin, which is full of hepatitis A antibodies and should help you then in order to prevent that in, in infection. Next slide. Um, the data on the long-term response to hepatitis A vaccine in HIV is still, I think, uh, not optimal. I think more data is needed. Uh, of what we've learned so far, it looks as if in HIV-positive individuals there is a decrease in hepatitis C antibodies over time. Um, most of the people are still protected after a year, 88 to 100 percent protection and 85 percent protection after four years, 75 percent after five years, uh, but there are people after 10 years who have no antibodies left. We're currently investigating that in our own court, and there are people who have been vaccinated but have no antibodies detectable anymore. Uh, so clearly, I think in this context of HIV, contrast to the general recommendations, uh, I think it would make sense to uh, repeat hepatitis A serology, and if there's no antibody uh, to revaccinate uh, that given individual. Clearly, in general, when you get vaccine or vaccinated in the context of HIV, your responses are much better if you are well controlled by HIV therapy and your HIV viral load is undetectable. And um, that is even more important than your C4 count. So clearly, uh, vaccinating once you have reached undetectability after diagnosis of HIV, then that really is probably a much better time point for vaccinating than right after diagnosis of HIV. Next slide. So I think what we're facing right now is a hepatitis A outbreak really from all major European large cities where a lot of gay men enjoy living and going out and having fun. And uh, transmission, although traditionally occurs fecal oral, uh, in particular over uh, food which has been prepared or unclean water, really the main risk here I think is sexually through in particular rim, rimming or oral uh, in contacts. And uh, there is clearly a need for increasing our hepatitis A and B vaccination rates. I think hepatitis B is probably less important in the setting of HIV positive individuals because most of them are on therapy and tenofovir has been shown 
to be protective against a new hepatitis D infection. So even if you're not responding to your vaccine or haven't been vaccinated, but you're on TDF, then that is a different way of kind of a pre-exposure prophylaxis for hepatitis B. Uh, but in that setting, hepatitis A, I think is something you really have to watch out. Remember everyone to see is the serology negative and clearly uh, people have to be vaccinated. And I think the role of the community here is in light of the outbreak and all the people presenting now with acute hepatitis A, which I tell you, in the individual is quite a problem because yes, you can say it doesn't become chronic and after that you have lifelong protection, but people feel pretty horrible over five, six weeks. And in the case of the one male nurse we have, for example, he's doing a training course on intensive care and now has to stop because he's shedding hepatitis A, can't work in the hospital for a while, and may not be able to pick up in his course again. His whole educational effort here may be delayed by half a year or a whole year. So it can be quite a burden and clearly something which can be prevented by vaccine. So uh, I think uh, spread the news that there is an outbreak of hepatitis A going on in Europe and that people should go for vaccination. And I'll stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Jürgen, very much. This was really, really interesting. And um, let me let me first of all see if there's any uh, one asking a question, not yet, um, and I'm also looking at whether there's anyone who has raised their hands, but that uh, we have Manuel. Um, uh, Manuel, are you here? I give you, I give you the, um, I unmute you and then you can raise your question personally. So, um, yeah, Manuel. Go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, thank you so much. I would like to ask, uh, what about the problems of the availability of the vaccine? Because, for example, in Italy we had uh, an outbreak of HIV, uh, but uh, uh, we had not a vaccine available. I, um, uh, I would like to know if uh, there's the same problem in Europe as well. Yeah, so I, I think we have been facing vaccine shortages in many different European countries. Uh, in Germany, there was a shortage of certain hepatitis A vaccines, uh, particularly in, when they were given in combination with typhus uh, vaccines or some combination for people who are going you know, to work in Peace Corps in Africa or something. Uh, but, but the single vaccine for uh, hepatitis A in Germany, at least Havlix, for example, has been available and is available right now. Uh, so uh, I don't know whether it's a specific Italian problem or, uh, but, but for now, at least in the German context, hepatitis E vaccine is available again. I know that some of the combination vaccines have been difficult and they're being promised to be back uh, in October. But uh, I can easily imagine that when there suddenly is an outbreak and there's an increased need, um, that that can cause problems. Actually, we recently had a, 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 a like a mini survey um, asking around within the ATG, and we find that this is more of a general problem across Europe. Many people have complained from all different parts of Europe that there was a shortage of hepatitis A vaccines and even if you wanted to pay for it there wasn't any available so i think that it's a more widespread problem which may be linked mm -hmm. to the outbreaks that you that you outlined yeah well um, I, yeah I, I think you know at least for me the big surprise was that this year i heard at conferences an outbreak in portugal in spain in france in netherlands italy and germany so obviously it's everywhere and you can you know and and Usually things are produced at a certain rate and if suddenly there's, you know, like a change and a lot more people want to be vaccinated, I can easily imagine that it becomes a shortage. Obviously companies have to be encouraged to increase their production, but I can presume that that takes some time or logistically can be challenging. Um, obviously. Now, I, I would have a question because uh, there's nothing else flagged right now, but I do have another question. Um, which is related to the price of the vaccine. Is it expensive or is it something that's affordable? Is it, um, I'm not so familiar. We also uh, asked around about the prices of the, 
of the vaccines, and we had a, we had a very wide range of uh, of prices quoted by the members. But in your experience, how much is or how much could it be if it uh, if we just uh, take uh, an, an an optimum scenario? Yeah. So in Germany, the price so there there are different productions and different companies, uh, and it's probably gets as low as around 65 euro in Germany. So that's not for, so, for how many? Because uh, that's only for one vaccination, and you need in the end you need two, right? So that would be 120. Okay, so that would have been my other question. So it's it's one shot basically that yeah, you get for yeah. 65. Uh, yeah. so, so it's not exactly cheap then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but there are also there are much cheaper ones I think from other sources. So you know Germany is always the most expensive because of the how they reimburse. I mean, at least for hepatitis C drugs, you know very well that mm. our drugs are maybe I don't know thirty five, forty thousand, and they're only maybe four thousand dollars somewhere else. So I think you really have to check locally in your country because the prices right. can be very, very different from um, uh, from uh, you know. Yeah. So maybe this would be um, this could be a, a reasonable or meaningful advocacy target to uh, to map the situation uh, in a systematic way. Um, and would that be useful yeah. for for the for the medical community as well? So for you uh, working on the doctor side. Yeah, and I think what would be helpful. What, what could be helpful is also if you you know if you do these kind of surveys and you realize where shortages are. One question could be, well, which country is there no shortage, and is there a way over international pharmacy, the order of vaccines there, for example, what does it cost? Right, that would be a helpful. Because right, right. if things can't be, like in, in Germany, if I can't get uh, a certain drug or a vaccine or whatever, uh, here I can still try to get it over international pharmacy because, for example, for some tropical medicines uh, which are not produced here or are given so solemnly that they don't really exist here, I can still buy them sometimes you know, somewhere else. Uh, and then I can do that over the international pharmacy. And so there are ways of ordering, you know, things somewhere else. And, and, and if you, you know, sort of know where, is there a country where you could order it or is there, you know, access that might be helpful. Right. Now, the other, uh, the other thing is that, um, do you think it would, it would make um, uh, sense then to, to launch and roll out uh, like a bigger advocacy action in order to inform um, the MSM community, and this is why I think it's so so important that we're having this webinar um, as a joint effort by Iglio and 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 Ilga Europe as well, uh, because they have they have a very good outreach to to the gay and and MSM communities. Um, would it make sense, or or would it just add to the panic, or what 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 is your what is your recommendation? Well, my recommendation here is, I think, is very clear. This is a vaccine-preventable disease, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think gay men have to know that they are at risk for hepatitis A, but something they can prevent. And just, you know, and, and obviously people are much more willing to take responsibility and they want to protect themselves. And if that is PrEP uh, for HIV, uh, you know, then hepatitis A vaccine is another thing you want to do to make sure you don't, Get it right, and and um, currently we're um, analyzing the questionnaires from a testing center, which is offered from the community from the uh, Cologne AIDS in Cologne called Checkpoint. And um, one of the interesting findings there is is that there's one question: Do you know whether you are hepatitis A and B vaccinated? Eighty percent don't know whether they're vaccinated or not. Right? So there's very little information on your own vaccination status. Have you ever been offered? Has that ever been talked about? And and so I think there is still a big lack uh, in particular. And I think it's easier maybe for HIV positive individuals because usually you do, you know, these serologies upon HIV diagnosis and then your doctor is going to say, well, listen, you know, your antibodies are negative and we should do vaccination. Maybe we'll do that after you start your HIV therapy and you become undetectable because of the vaccine responses are better, but usually that's sort of addressed, at least here in my clinic, that's what everyone talks about at least once, and then it could be that maybe you forget the second vaccination, or, you know, uh, or people say, I'll do it with work because I'm working in the hospital and I'll get vaccinated there anyway, or I don't know what, but at the end of the day, it's at least it would be addressed, so there's a chance, but for 
HIV negative MSM, I have a feeling that not uh, everyone really knows about these risks and how he can protect himself. And that's something I think the community could help spreading the news without causing panic. But I think the fact that there are outbreaks in all major gay uh, cities with big gay populations, I think at least uh, should be of concern because this is something we can still we can still shape the epidemic. Right, right. So it's more like spreading information and and uh, yeah. yeah, okay, good. Now, uh, just very quickly, how expensive is the test? Is it uh, is it a cheap one or is it a more complicated, expensive test? No, but the, the antibody test is not very expensive. I don't think that that's going to be much more than I don't know, 20 euro or something like that. That shouldn't be very expensive because Can you don't really need it. Yeah, very easy. It can be done pretty much in every lab because it's just an antibody test. So in contrast okay. to hepatitis C where you need a viral load, that's PCR. PCR is always expensive, but we don't need a PCR really. What you want to know is do I have antibodies already, yes or no? That's a cheap test. All right. This is what I wanted to uh, find out whether this can be done in community settings like uh, like we do with HIV rapid testing. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So that also offers a, a, an avenue for for advocacy input um, into into yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know whether we offer that at the checkpoint. I know we offer hepatitis C testing. Um, I don't know whether hepatitis A testing is part of that. That's something I would have to check myself too. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe maybe we can also check with other um, uh, checkpoint uh, workers from from yeah. our networks because I can yeah. see if I look at the list of participants that there's quite a number of people here listening to us who are working in checkpoints or even leading checkpoints. So um, maybe it would make sense to clarify this issue with them whether they offer hepatitis A tests and uh, whether it would make sense to offer hepatitis A antibody tests. Um, now, since there are no additional questions, I would like to thank you very much, um, uh, Jürgen, for your time. This was highly informative. And as, uh, as promised before, um, I uh, will edit this and upload this webinar to all the various networks. And it will, of course, also be made available through um, Elga Europe and Iglio. And I would like to thank them a lot for their involvement and participation and support. Um, of this uh, of this effort, which I think is extremely important, that the community also does something in order to uh, to prevent further um, uh, spreading of um, of these of of this uh, illness and of the of the outbreaks uh, that you that you just outlined. So with that, uh, very very last calls to everyone. If you have any questions, then raise your hands now. And if not, and I count to three, one two, three, no more questions. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, I'm looking forward to meeting you again very soon. Take care. And thank you, Jürgen. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Tamash. Thank you. Bye, everyone.